Ephesians 3.20 says something absolutely astonishing. It's amazing. Every time I quote it, it just shakes me to the core. God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. Let's be intentional about activating that power right now in our lives, in your life. Heavenly Father, we activate the exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think in our lives. Father, we believe we receive your help, your power, your wisdom, your joy overflowing right now in our lives, in our homes, in our families, in Jesus' precious name. And Lord, as we approach your word, give us revelation. Revelation that's life-changing right now in Jesus' name. Faith Moves, part four. This has been such an exciting series. It's just, well, it's causing faith to grow up in my heart. I know as I meditate on the word, faith comes by hearing. Faith Moves, part four, and this specifically is Faith Moves, your shield in place. Faith Moves, your shield in place right now you may be facing some major challenges. Just rest. Take a deep breath. God's got his eye on you, and he wants to speak to your heart right now. He has the answer, so listen to him. When some people speak of faith, they refer to it as blind faith. Basically, it's a trust and belief that something good will happen even though there's no evidence to base such hope on. For the record, that's not true faith. And by true faith, I mean the stuff that is born from God's word. Max Licato, famous author and minister, once said this, Our belief in God is not blind faith. Belief is having a firm conviction something is true, not hoping it's true. Real Bible faith is not blind, but it sees, it perceives. That's right, faith sees, it knows, and real faith moves. Let's review the Bible definition of real faith again. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance, title deed, confirmation of things hoped for, divinely guaranteed, and the evidence of things not seen, the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Faith has so much proof, my dear friend, it has so much substance, evidence, that it comes with a title deed of things divinely guaranteed. That's right. Genuine faith is neither blind or baseless. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace, unmerited favor, to make it stable and valid and guaranteed. When a builder points out an empty, ugly piece of land and then rolls out the blueprints he just picked up from his architect and engineer, he sees what's about to happen on that land. He sees beautiful buildings, manicured grounds, expensive landscaping, and new trees. He sees streetlights coming on at night and perfectly paved streets weaving in and around structures and common areas, play areas. Of course, it's just barren, ugly ground right now, but faith sees what will be be, and the title deed, along with the blueprints, are evidence. They're evidence of the guarantee. Faith talks the end result, not the empty, undeveloped lot. Faith articulates the dream. Faith moves new realities. Jonathan Turley, professor of law at George Washington University and a criminal, famous criminal defense attorney, once said this, Faith is the one thing that no system of government can do without. Without faith in the underlying values of a constitutional system, authority rests on a mix of coercion and capitulation. And yet, this is the very reason people shake their fist at God. They either want God to force His will on them as proof of life or give in to society's new version of morality. Intellectual and political elites have intentionally targeted the space in a person's heart meant for faith and substituted a steady diet of doubt and grievances. Bitterness has deep roots that lie against the truth. And as you know, faith comes by hearing the word of truth. 
So for some, faith is actually perceived as being ugly. Let me explain where faith gets this bad rap. Some people have been so turned off, even disgusted with the idea of faith. When immature individuals profess to use faith in God, but actually fall into presumption, it gets ugly, not good. They look stupid, but worse, it misrepresents the character of Almighty God. When immature people think they're working faith and really just rolling around in presumption, it's offensive. Often presumption leads to others getting hurt, offended, and disappointed in God, and God had nothing to do with it. A friend once told me about these Bible college kids who had heard the message of faith, sort of, sort of, but not fully, and decided that they were going to use their faith to take care of their restaurant bill. So they went out, had a great dinner, ordered big, and then when the bill came, they did something stupid, something presumptuous. The waiter passed them the bill, and the student said, by faith, we call this bill paid. The waiter, he just stared, not sure what planet they stepped off. He blinked a few times and then just simply said, I'll get the manager. <laughs> the bill wasn't paid. They were banned from the restaurant, but worst of all, faith in God was misrepresented in a most disrespectful, ignorant way. Faith isn't presumption. Real faith moves. If those students had real faith, why didn't they exercise it to move a part-time J-O-B into their life? If they had faith, why didn't they start a lawn mowing business or at least a lemonade stand? Why didn't they use their faith to donate their service to a local mission to feed the homeless and maybe have a bowl of soup with one of those guys living on the streets? Faith never moves you into a dishonest action of stealing someone else's stuff, even if it's a diner's food and a waitress's tip. Those students ripped off the restaurant, stole from the waitress and the cook, and they dishonored the name of God. True faith doesn't assume or presume. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Those students didn't work their faith to earn the money, but presumed to have faith to scam a meal. Faith in God is honorable. It's ethical. It's not counterfeit. Faith doesn't pass checks. It can't cash. In the movie Top Gun, I don't know if you've seen it or remembered this, but in the original movie Top Gun, Commander Stinger reprimanded Maverick when he was doing his flybys, and he said, you don't own that plane. The taxpayers do. Son, your ego is writing checks. Your body can't cash. So let's look at the real thing. Let's examine the real thing. David, the famous shepherd boy, he went up against an enemy giant that everyone was afraid of. He wasn't skilled with a soldier's sword or shield at that point, but he had spent countless of hours with his slingshot. He wasn't just good at it, he was great with a slingshot. Still, when he went up against the giant, he put all of his faith in God, using his words to publicly express his faith, saying he would kill the giant in the name of the Lord. Not with a slingshot, he said, in the name of the Lord. David worked authentic faith by putting his life, all his skill, and his confession of belief on the line. Faith moves when you work it. So show me evidence of what you believe. David prepared, declared, and then unpaired the giant's head from his body all by faith. You see, it's not all about what we do in the natural, and yet it is. Generally, our actions express what we believe, whether consciously or non-consciously. For example, tipping. If you tip the wait staff after a meal on your restaurant bill, then you could be generous, believing it's the right thing to do. Or, on the other hand, you might be stingy but feel socially coerced, even shamed into a behavior. In this familiar example of everyday life, we have what looks like the same action by two different people, but really the deeds are opposing because the beliefs are polar opposite. Doing the right thing comes from the heart. Your heart activates your faith. Jesus talked about two men praying in the same temple to the same God. Think of that. Same building, praying to the same God. Now, from the outside physical action, who knows? But they're both doing the exact same thing, except Jesus knows what's in their heart. One is praying from a place of pride, expressing faith in himself. The other guy is praying from a place of humility, expressing no faith in his own righteousness, but all his faith is in God's mercy. Jesus tells us that the first guy was presumptuous. His arrogance took him nowhere. 
Well, what about the second guy who expressed humility and reliance on God? His faith moved him into right status with God. And the Bible says he was justified. He went home justified, forgiven, blessed. Why? Because faith, faith moves. Here's a famous scripture on faith that people often misinterpret as using faith and flesh for a hybrid kind of doctrine. James 2, verse 26. Now, you've heard this before. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. No, no, you cannot mix faith and flesh. It's not talking about you mixing a little faith in God with a bunch of human effort. God's not weak. God's not incapable of finishing what he starts. God is not mocked either when it comes to sowing and reaping. To have faith without works is best interpreted this way. It's having faith without corresponding action. Or say it this way, faith that doesn't work, doesn't work. It's dead, inactive, it's dormant, it's going nowhere. The works of James 2.26 are works of obedience. Obedience is epic. Spiritually, God attention grabbing. Obedience is corresponding action. When Moses and the children of Israel were escaping slavery, they went out into the wilderness and they got trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's killer army. That's called being caught between the devil and the deep blue sea. Moses prayed a prayer in faith, and guess what God told him to do? God said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes the corresponding action to your faith is to stand still. Sometimes it's going to see the doctor. Sometimes it's not eating what you want to eat. Sometimes it's not drinking what you'd like to drink. Sometimes corresponding action is to turn off your phone, turn off the TV, get alone, and let God speak a quiet peaceful word into your life. It can take time, a process to clear the room and let God have the floor of your attention. It's ultimately called obedience. Yes, it's epic, my friend. God's speaking. Are you listening? When the prophet Elijah ran away from the murderous queen Jezebel, he got weak, depressed, sad, mad, and even a little bit crazy. He started cave dwelling and thinking he was the only one left in the world who believed on God. When he finally stopped, slowed down, opened up his ears to hear, God spoke softly to him. Elijah, he said, what are you doing here? See, Elijah had been following his senses, his reasonings, and his intellect. That lowered the ceiling for faith to move him from here to there. He let his senses move him, but they moved him somewhere sad and depressing. God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Basically, God was saying, I didn't put you in this nowhere place. He felt vulnerable and unprotected. God doesn't have a problem handling the Jezebels of life. God didn't even use an army to defeat the wicked queen. No, she ended up getting eaten by a bunch of stray dogs. Jezebel actually started the very first dog food company. <laughs> but, but what? Is that too soon? Faith moves, so don't run away. Don't be scared. Don't be frightened. God's got you. He loves you. To live successfully in this world, you need a shield, a movable shield. It's got to move with you everywhere you go. You can look at the news on any random day and be persuaded that you and your family need protection, right? I was watching a special on a major historic events from hundreds of years ago, 200 years ago, and then even 300 years ago. And guess what? It really didn't matter when you lived on earth. You need protection. We all need protection no matter what season we're in. Just today, I looked at the news for a quick sampling for you to prove a point. An elderly businessman was beaten with a bat. A congresswoman was carjacked. A small business owner had their store broken into and trashed. A person with a long criminal history kidnapped a nine-year-old girl from a camping site. Border Patrol captured known terrorists sneaking into the country, and a public school teacher was arrested for molesting a student. I barely got off page two, and I had to quit reading because people and families are being violated in mass. It's horribly sad to see what's happening, but this has been happening for centuries, for centuries. 
Tracy Morgan, the famous comedian and actor, he said, bad news travels at the speed of light. Good news travels like molasses. Unfortunately, society does focus and feed on the bad news. Now, we seem to hear that with every advancement in technology, there are new forms of crime and lawlessness victimizing the weak and the vulnerable. School bullying even, that used to be something that a kid could escape from, but now it follows them home through social media and torments them 24 seven. We all need protection. Your family needs a shield, not a box where you're locked away on a hill somewhere far away from living life. Elijah's story showed us that God's not calling us to cave dwelling. No, that's not living life strong, is it? You need a shield that moves with you all around you, that's impenetrable to the enemy, but light and easy to carry with you at all times. It doesn't need to be a burden. What could that be? Oh, Pastor Stephen, what could that be? Ephesians 6, verse 16. Lift up over all the covering shield of saving faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one. Oh, that's powerful, isn't it? Faith moves mountains. Faith moves fig trees, books, couches even. And yes, faith moves as a shield to protect you and your family. Oh, that's so good. The question is, are you intentional about being under the covering of this impenetrable shield? It's not this archaic old Roman shield made of strips of wood and leather glued together. The shield of faith is unbelievably high tech. It's invisible. It can stop missiles, bullets, cyber stalking, bullying, accusations, lies, UFC punches, and phone scams but it must be activated like everything else in God's kingdom by faith. Notice that Ephesians 6 instructs us to lift up over all the shield of faith. So how do we do that? How do we lift up the shield of faith? Well, as we've been learning in this series about faith, we've realized that faith is voice activated. It's voice activated. Say that, faith is voice activated. Oh, that's good. Right from the start, we heard Jesus say in Matthew 17, 20, if you have faith, you will what? Say, say. So you, you can have faith, but not be activating it. Some of us have actually had faith, but been influenced by the world and activated doubt instead of faith. You activate doubt when you say. We know doubt invites trouble. Okay, so let's get super practical about faith moves. You need to activate, turn on, power up, engage, and work your faith. Yes, even if it's just a mustard seed sized grain of faith, that's no problem. Jesus said, if you've got it, use it. Faith moves, so here's a practical step-by-step -step guide to help you release and trigger that movement. Number one, you gotta find hope. Find hope. You need hope for faith to activate. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. You see, faith needs a target. It needs an objective to move toward because that's how it creates a spiritual circuit, if you will. The psalmist said in Psalm 37 verse 4, to delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Too many people don't know what they want because they're not intentional or they've been hurt, abused, and even taught religious things like to deny their desires and hopes for a higher enlightenment. No! All that does is to entrench self-deception. Colossians 2 says that kind of severity of discipline only further indulges your flesh. You must find hope, okay? Number two, search God's word. So after the hope, you gotta search God's word for the correlation. This may answer a question about number one, find hope. How do I know if my hope is God's will? Easy, get a scripture that is an answer to your hope. So if your hope is to do something immoral, you'll soon see that you cannot find a scripture to support your lawless endeavor. In the process though, you will find a scripture that corrects your immoral hope and gives clarity on God's inspired hope that is life-changing. 
Paul the Apostle did that. Believe it or not, he had the desire and hope, get this, of arresting and persecuting as many Christians as possible. That was his hope. Jesus met him on the road of Damascus, gave him a revelation of truth, and converted his hopes to a lifelong mission of winning people to the faith and exercising God's powerful gifts for good. So you can't go wrong. When you do step number two, search God's word as it connects with your hopes. Then number three, you gotta set your mind. You set your mind with your gates. Here's what I mean. You possess gates to your heart. For most people, they are the eye gates and the ear gates. For the blind who can read using the braille system, communication through touch reaches their heart. Because these are gateways to your heart, you have to be intentional about targeting your gates with faith-building messages that reach your heart. Repetition determines your persuasion. Not the truth, but your repetition. That's why so many people are lost and confused. They listen to fools 24 seven, and so they believe fools. Like the saying goes, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. In setting your mind, you must also censure your gates from whatever would contradict God's truth. Faith runs on pure fuel and a steady foot on the accelerator. If you want to get to where you're going, set your mind. How? Put scripture in your handwriting on your mirror. Put little notes on the desktop of your laptop. Record your voice reading the key verses and play them as you drive down the road. Don't listen to country songs about the guy who lost his truck and his dog if you're believing God for a new truck and a new dog. Set your mind to work your faith. Double-mindedness doesn't work, so set your mind. Steady, constant, unrelenting, persistent, set your mind. Number four, add obedient action. We talked about this, right? When James 2.26 says, faith without works is dead, it was giving us a perfect picture of how faith moves within a body or a context. It's like a car engine can be this powerful force that moves Formula One race cars over 200 miles an hour down the track, but if it doesn't have a car body to sit in, it ain't going anywhere. You don't have to be a car expert to understand that. Faith without a corresponding body or corresponding action of obedience isn't going anywhere. So let's say that you have faith to play guitar, but you never buy a guitar or borrow your Uncle Bob's. Never take guitar lessons or go online and study an instructional video. Your faith has nothing to attach to. All that torque produced by the engine of faith is just spinning nothing so nothing ever happens. Add obedient action to your faith plan. And number five, practice the victory. You got to practice the victory. In part one of the series, we read Jesus' word in Mark 11, 22, and then I'll skip to 24. And Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. Then verse 24, for this reason, I'm telling you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe, trust, and be confident that it's granted to you and you will get it. What's the best way to show trust and confidence that something is granted to you? By practicing the victory. Imagine the answer of your faith showing up, landing at your front door manifesting today. What would you do? You would give God an enthusiastic praise, wouldn't you? You'd say, praise God, we have the answer. Thank you, Father God, for your provision. Practice the victory. It's a strong action that correlates to your answer. King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 had to do exactly that as part of his obedient action unto God when receiving deliverance from thousands and thousands of terrorists that had surrounded Judah. God told the king that he would fight their battle for them. Well, that's a great thing. So then Jehoshaphat responded by having the choir of singers march out front, not the soldiers, but the choir singing, God is good and his mercy endureth forever. They were singing that before the end enemy was even destroyed, or from God's perspective, the enemy was already destroyed, but when the choir sang, they cashed the check, so to speak. However you want to look at it, the truth remains, you must practice the victory. Sing, pray, celebrate, practice your testimony now. Give God thanks, but practice the victory now and every day. Faith moves, my friend. Are you sick? Remember Jesus' word to the man healed of leprosy. Your faith springing from your belief in God has restored you. Faith moves. It springs up, jumps to attention, goes to work, gets heavenly results. 
You want that. God wants that for you. God paid a high price with the life of his only begotten son, Jesus, to get authority back into your life so that you could live by faith, walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. Forget about fairness. That's the world's weak attempt at acquiring the good life. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. How? By having faith in him, not in you, but in him. The just shall live by faith. That's you living by faith. No more living stuck. No more living in fear, unprotected, uncovered. No more relying on you, the family, the government, or your job. Faith moves. Do everything you do by faith in God. His promises are the outcome of faith and depend entirely on faith. Faith moves. Pray this after me. Father, it's time. I place all my faith in you. Your word is truth. My hope is in you now. I believe Jesus is your son, born of the Blessed Virgin. He died on the cross, was raised up on the third day. It's the good news and I believe it. Jesus is alive. By faith, I put on the whole armor of God. I activate the shield of faith. As a child of God, thank you, Lord, for this privilege. Say it again. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege. All in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.